so good evening sir uh, thank you uh, thank you dd sir and uh, thanks for uh, giving the opportunity and thanks jignesh sir and uh, ashok sir for joining us uh, is my screen visible sir yes sir. yeah yeah go ahead go ahead yes so just uh, seeing more about this postromedial tibial condyle fractures uh, we wanted to uh, see what is the incidence that is uh, being prevalent there out and the, how to identify these fractures what is the various ways that we can classify them and how to evaluate them radiologically and what is the approaches that we can do <clears throat> so this is a 62 year old gentleman who had a fall from two wheeler they had presented with the inability to bear, bear weight in the left lower limb <clears throat> and uh, now Seeing this x-ray, we need to know how to go about this fracture and what is the classification that is being used. <clears throat> Although so many uh, classifications that have been there in uh, Vogue now, but uh, <clears throat> the, none of the fractures are directly classified using this, uh, this fractures. So we know the mechanism of uh, injury of uh, these fractures is uh, injury to a plex knee associated with the varus stress. And only seeing an AP x-ray can lead to a, a wrong diagnosis. A lateral view or a CT scan obviously helps in diagnosing these fractures. And always we need to have a soft tissue examination as important as a medial condyle fracture is considered to be a high velocity injury. And when these fragments are left unnoticed or even they're not even uh, given adequate planning, they can displace with the, along with the distal femur either inferiorly or medial. So uh, their preoperative planning has to be very good. Here we can see a, a similar type of fracture where uh, it can lead to an early collapse if not fixed properly or a bicondylar fracture where there's a small postromedial fragment. It was though seen in the CT scan, but uh, hence addressed only with the lateral plate can lead to a late postoperative collapse. So the proper preoperative pre pre planning is very important in all these uh, postromedial uh, fractures. And uh, these fractures are not classified by the routine uh, uh, classifications that we use, the Shatsker and the AOTA. Uh, they classify, they don't classify the coronal plane fractures. Uh, Moore had a, a very good classification of these kind of injuries in 1981. After that, the real uh, game changer in these kind of fractures came from Louis et al, where he classified using a CT in all these uh, uh, fracture patterns. So they had used uh, three point lines and uh, after these fractures, after this Louis classification, there has been uh, so many of a revision or a modified three column classifications that we use presently. So the various uh, fixation options that we can use, uh, we can use a, a screw or a plate from the medial to the lateral side holding the fragment. Or when the locking plate came into work in 2005 and 10, uh, many of the fractures were fixed using a lateral locking plate holding the medial fragments. Or an anterior to posterior screw were used directing the, to the towards the posterior side, posterior medial side and holding the fracture pattern. Or a buttress plate that can be used also. When you see the literature considering which is the best method of fixing these fractures, uh, this paper uh, showed a biomechanical study considering all these uh, patterns of fixation. And they find that the posterior buttress plate is biomechanically the most stable in, vi in vitro fixation method. Here is just, uh, just a point, point that uh, where you want to put your thumb in reducing these fractures will be the exact plane where you want to put a plate. You put a plate parallel to the fracture pattern and the screw goes perpendicular compressing the fracture. So I just wanted to um, um, show a case where it was done using a postromedial approach. Um, this, this is the fracture. <clears throat> so we use the Lobanoffer approach. <clears throat> it is uh, done using the patient in prone. We remove one of the board positions and the serial draping is completed. So we use a six to eight centimeter incision along the medial border of the gastronomies. We expose the gastroc. Once the gastroc is exposed, you see the popliteus. It's slowly erased from the medial to the lateral side. You see the fracture. Seeing this fracture pattern, you have a triangle where you can use two steam pins just to lever the fracture and you achieve a temporary reduction with the K-wave and you gradually, uh, you buttress it with the buttress plate, hence uh, compressing the fracture and stabilizing it also. So this is the final picture that you get out of this. So this is uh, relatively an easy approach. So coming back to the patient, again, you need to assess the soft tissue, how it was looking like. It was, uh, it was not tense. So, uh, and we also did a CT scan. Reading a CT in uh, these fractures is very important. You need to identify how far it is displaced posteriorly and how it is uh, uh, inferiorly subluxed. You need to know both of them so that you can know whether it is displaced and how stable the fracture is. Most often these fractures have a shear component, so they're considered unstable. And in various loads of knee flexion, they tend to displace further. So this was how it was done. We did a postomedial approach and we uh, fixed with the postomedial plate. Uh, this is at uh, six months and uh, gradually it had, had a good functional outcome. 
and he was having a he was doing all his normal activities so coming to a case two where again seeing this x-ray in a 24 year old man uh, he had a traffic accident we may seem that it was uh, it looks innocuous but once you get a lateral view you will be able to see a, a different kind of picture altogether so you need a proper ct scan to evaluate these factors <clears throat> when you get a ct there are me three main problems you can see in these pictures uh, you can see a big posteromedial fragment that is visible here and when you go more lateral there is also also a lateral fragment that is subluxed posteriorly and there is a depression that is there with an intact anterior hinge so this is a 3d scanning also helps you on get, getting a better idea and this helps you in identifying where you need to put the plate and which is the better area of your plate position to compress the fracture so we went ahead first we compressed a lateral fragment which was relatively small but it had a good buttress plate sitting on it and you compressed holding the fragment and then a medial plate posterior medial plate holding and compressing the fracture at the end of your uh, fixation the anterior depression needs to be elevated we used the uh, uh, steinman pin technique when we find this hinge is uh, intact anteriorly and uh, it was elevated and it was held with a 6.5 screw and the fragment being small again a small 3 35 screw also was used so this is post op x-ray we had a good outcome in this approach we had to use an extensile uh, lateral approach so uh, for uh, exposing the lateral uh, posterior lateral content and this is his uh, functional outcome yeah at the end of 2 years follow so uh, just to conclude posterior medial fragments uh, are not uncommon it may literature wise also and we also see almost one third of all uh, bicondylar tibia fractures having a posterior medial component associated with them and they are unstable inherently they need fixation and they can get loaded in various uh, knee flexions so you need to uh, get a proper ct scan you can plan the approach if the wherever you want to put your thumb to reduce the fracture put the plate on the side ideally you plate the compression side which will be very effective in compressing these fractures and posterior medial approach is relatively a safe approach you stay away from the vessels and it gives a direct visual exp- um, uh, visual look so that you can reduce and compress the fracture and the biomechanically also it remains a very stable construct thank you sir